There he is. Hello, Joe. Evening, gents. All right. How are you, sir? Yeah, I'm fine, thank you. Yourself? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. Good. Uh, Joe, that's the one with glasses. <laughs> yeah, so I guess that, I guess that. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, mate, obviously, we just go through bits with you. Um, yeah, of course. Obviously, before we, we get on, just just obviously tell us a little bit about yourself, about, um, obviously, your football first, and, 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 and then, obviously, you know, what what happened to yourself a, a year ago, or just under a year or so ago? Yeah, um, football, football, I uh, started my um, coaching slash managerial career at um, Kent, football, Kent Football United, believe it or not. Um, yeah, stayed there for um, roughly three months with Sam McNeil um, in the early days when they'd just gone into the league. I think they were two years into the league or something. Um, really enjoyed my time there. Um, and then the Cray Valley job um, become available, the uh, coaches job. The coaches left there and uh, I remember coming home one night after a game at Kent Football and um, the old man said to me that, uh, Cray Valley coaching jobs available. Um, I know Chapo well. I know Mark Edwards down there. He said, would you like me to give him a call and see if they'll um, have an interview with you? Um, and that's when really I started to get majorly into it, if I'm honest with you. Um, that was my first real coaching journey. I went down for the interview, sat there with Chapo and Mark and uh, we had a good chat and um, I told them how I like to coach, how I like to play and it all fitted in. And um, yeah, that was where I started, really, to be honest with you. That was my main sort of um, coaching role, first role in the uh, the now Scaffold League, but I think it was the Kent League back then. And then, obviously, you know, you, you went through, and, and I think you, you was at Sporting Club Thamesmead, wasn't you? Yeah, so um, when I was at Cray Valley, uh, I spent two seasons at Cray, um, and then my dad um, was offered the year from Belvedere job, if you remember. Um, after Mickey Collins went up, um, he left the club, and um, John phoned my dad, and... Um, and that was a hard decision to leave Cray, but I didn't think that I'd have the opportunity to work at that level with my dad, if I'm honest with you again. Um, so I took that with both hands and um, we had a really good side down there, Keith, to be honest with you. And um, we were doing really well. We were flying. Um, we were, I think we was in the top eight in the league at the time. And then for whatever reason, things didn't work out. And um, we ended up, my dad ended up um, being told that his services weren't no longer required there. And uh, Soon after, they offered me to stay on because he offered me to stay on. And I, I sort of said, no, mate, it's not, it's, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to stay loyal to the old man. And uh, I went with him. Um, and then I didn't I didn't touch football for um, probably a year and a half. Um, and uh, it was only when really my friends asked me if I wanted to take a under-18 job um, that I went back into it, to be honest with you. I was going to stay out of it. I was concentrating on my coaching company. That was going really well at the time. It was growing. And... Um, it was only when um, I got introduced to these young sort of, uh, they were under 16s at the time when I took them on, first year in under 18 football. And they reminded me of our side, Keith, if I'm honest with you, our under 18 side we had at Thamesmead. They were just a, a great bunch of lads, powerful, strong, could pass the ball. And yeah, I thought this would be a nice little project for the next couple of years. So that's what I've done. We're just going back, obviously, you know, tell us how, how strange was it sort of, or how did it feel working with your dad? Because obviously, you know, we're, we're going to talk about your dad in, in a little while, but, yeah, uh, you know, you, you, I'm, I've known you since you was a little kid and, and you watch your dad manage every mm. single game. You, you went everywhere with your dad yeah. as, as a young boy and, until you grew up. Yeah. Um, and obviously, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you, you become a sort of a man yourself and, and all of a sudden now you're in a dugout with your dad. How yeah. did that feel? It was, it was really good, to be honest with you. It was really enjoyable. I, I loved every minute of it. I mean, as you said, I, I was with the old man, Keith, from four years old up until whatever, 16, going to watch matches with him and stuff. You know what I mean? And uh, I was in the dugout. I was in the in the changing room at times, probably being a pest to the players half my life. You know what I mean? But um, yeah, no, I loved every minute working with him. I learned a lot, to be honest with you, from him. Um, obviously, like you said, I learned rights and wrongs from him, more wrongs than probably rights. And um, it worked well because he was, he was as he was, you know what he was like, Keith. And um, I was a sort of a calmer one and a um, bit more tactical, but he knew how to get players going. He just had that, he had that thing about him where players just listened to him when they were in the changing room. And uh, I think that's quite a rare thing, but they, they, he, he seemed to get some players that, what he done well was he got players that weren't, doing so well at other clubs and brought them into him and uh, seemed to give them that motivation and that belief to play and uh, 
he, he built dressing rooms, as you know. Um, I mean, even even recently with all the lads that have been coming around and stuff, and they all say the same thing. The dressing rooms that he built was unbelievable. And that's something that I learned from him. I learned that, that you've got to have a good dressing room and you've got to have a good uh, team camaraderie to uh, to achieve things. You know what I mean? And uh, that was always key with what he wanted to plan. And, uh, yeah, he was quite successful at it. So, um, yeah, no, it was, it was brilliant working with him, mate. I, I, honestly, it was... Uh, it was a. It was only a little. It was a short while at Ira from Belvedere, and then obviously I got to work with him at Ira of Town again for a, a season and a half, and uh, we had a really good time, mate. Yeah, really enjoyed it. How bad was it for your mum though? Because obviously I know what your dad was like when you lost, but to have two of his in the ass <laughs> on a Saturday evening or whatever when you lose must happened, have been horrific. Happened on a few occasions, mate. Yeah, we uh. We tended to, we, we always said in the car on the way home, me and the old man, we was like, look, we've got to get home, can't can't talk about football in front of mum, we've been away all day, blah, 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 but you can't help it, you know what it's like, Keith, you're from a football, you, you've got a football background and you you, you just talk football, didn't you, that's all, that's all we done, it was all we done all night, how could we plan for the next game, who should we play in the next game, and it probably drove her mad, to be honest with you at times, but looking back now, mate, those are times that I'm going to cherish, you know what I mean, so I wouldn't have it any other way. No, that's good. Well, obviously, th- th- let's just go, go back to, obviously, you know, the last two years now, Joe, which is, yeah. it couldn't have been any any more horrific, I think, and I don't think you could uh, script it. But just, you know, just before, obviously, you know, you got ill, you was you was at Sporting Club Thamesmead, wouldn't you? And obviously, you, you know, your, your own yeah. coach business was, do- was doing well. So just sort of lead us into to, to what happened. Yeah, so like, like I said to you, I took the um, I took this this under eighteen side on. Um, they were at Cray Valley originally, um, and then we got me and my dad uh, got the year of town job. Um, so we took that, um, and then we obviously uh, we managed the under eighteen side alongside year of town. If I'm honest with you, because they had some good players in the under eighteen side that we we used in the Kent League. Ben Mandele being one of them, and Anthony Desit being another. Max Williams, um, and they were all playing regularly really for year of town in and out the side. So it worked really well. Um, and then, obviously, the under-18s went on to be really successful. They won everything there was to win, which was great. Um, and, uh, yeah, after um, after we we sort of um, left Irith Town, me and Dad, um, Albert wanted to go his own way with Jenko, which was fair enough at the end of the season. And um, he explained that to us. And, um, obviously, we, we went our way. We looked back that we'd done a good job there. We, we saved them from relegation the first year we went in. And then the second year, we finished mid-table quite comfortably and had a good run in the Cups and stuff and brought some really good youngsters through. So me and my dad were quite disappointed that he didn't really give us another year. I felt that if we had another year at that, we could have cracked it and, and done some done some more damage, to be honest with you. But, um, yeah, I mean, um, and then after that, um, it was my friend, really. It was, it was Aaron Jeffrey and Ben Williams and uh, Jamie Williams. We were all sitting down in the pub one day and um, Ben said to me, you know, Lee Hill's going to be leaving at the end of the year, Sporting Club Thamesmead. And... Uh, I sort of said to him, oh, that's um, that's that's an interesting one. And uh, I went and watched them play. I was really, in- I spoke to Sam, the chairman, and Lee. I was really interested and uh, really impressed by the setup there for such a, obviously, you know, Keith, you've been there for years, you know what I mean? And um, I won't go into too much detail. It's probably a sore subject. But, um, <laughs> yeah, obviously, uh, I was really impressed with them and the, amb- the ambition that they had. Um, and obviously, yeah, uh, I had a good chat and decided that that would be that would be a nice little role for me to take. Um, the old man didn't want to get back into it. I did did say to him, do you want to come in with me? He said no. And uh, he just come and watched all the games in the end. And um, yeah, I started managing them. Really, really enjoyed it. I had a lot of my under 18s that were with me at Long Lane and uh, brought a lot of them into the side as well as a few others. Um, Cameron Reardon and some players like that that were excellent for me. And um we had a really good, we had a really good young side, mate. We we battled against it. We beat Beckenham Town. Uh, we went away to Sheppey and we beat them in the cup. Got to the semi-final of the Kent Senior Trophy, I think it was. Um, yeah, we had a really, really good season, and um, it was just a shame I didn't get to complete it because I think that we could have probably finished in the top five or six that year, and uh, it would have been a really good season. But as you know, um, in March time, 2019, I uh, I fell ill. So just tell us, obviously, you know about the bad. Firstly, obviously. People that don't know, how old, how old was you then, Joe? Uh, t- I was 26. 26. 26. So, yeah. obviously, you know, it, it, it's, it's, t- tell us a little more about you and and how it started and, and, and go through what actually happened. 26. I'm lying, Keith. I was 28, mate. Sorry, mate. I'm lying about my age. Um, don't worry about that, mate. We all do it. <laughs> yeah. Women do it more than blokes. Um, yeah, so basically, mate, what happened was uh, around March, March, I feel a little bit tired. Um, I was saying to, saying to my family and uh, my friends and that, I just said, look, just feeling a little bit tired. I think I need to have a few days off work. And, um, yeah, just didn't feel myself, if I'm honest with you. Um, and then 
it was only really after a, a coaching session on a Thursday night. Um, I, I was working for my company and uh, come over a little bit funny at the coaching session. Nothing to worry about. Just like just felt a bit light headed and stuff. Anyway, I got home, drove home, and uh, we was meant to have another coaching session that evening. And I remember ringing Max, who was working for me at the time, Max Williams, and I said to him, "I can't, I can't come in tonight, mate. I just don't feel right." And uh, he said, "All right, no worries. I'll take the session." So I dropped all the equipment to him, went home. Um, I think I went to bed, mate. If I'm honest with you. Um, just woke up the next morning with with really bad belly pains and feeling sick and yeah I felt like I was going to faint and um, I said to me my parents that were in at the time my mum and my dad I said like I don't feel well I, I need an ambulance which was weird for me because um, when we look back on it now every all the doctors said you knew there was something there was obviously something wrong with you for you to uh, for you to come out with that you need an ambulance and uh, yeah and uh, obviously that was the day that. Um, I fell ill. That was that was the 29th of March 2019. So obviously, you know, you said you fell ill. So just just again, I, I want you to elaborate so people get a rough idea. So talk us, try and talk us through step by step. Obviously, what happened? Yeah. So basically, um, I got up in the morning, felt ill. Um, said to my mum that I needed to call an ambulance. Um, at first, uh, you know, mum was like, "Look, I think we're over exaggerating a little bit. Uh, go and take a couple of." Then get yourself back to bed, you'll be fine. Um, my dad shut up the chemist, actually got me some diarolites, thought I might have been dehydrated, took them on board, um, went back to bed literally for about 15, 20 minutes and uh, shouted down again, said, oh, I really don't feel well. Um, and it was my sister, my sister come in my room and uh, I, called an, I called an ambulance and told them and they said to me that it was a two hour wait because my symptoms weren't anything of concern. And um, then my sister come into my room. I, I booked the ambulance. My sister come in about five minutes later and she said, no, you don't look good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you to the hospital. Um, she took me to Queen Mary's. I went to the um, emergency department there, walked through the uh, walked through the reception, spoke to the lady again, told her my symptoms, um, went down to sit down. I was asked to wait. I think a few people that I was sitting down with realised that I weren't in a good way. Um by this time, there were like little purple blotches and stuff coming up on my skin. I didn't know at the time, but it was only when people sort of told me about that. And um, I was then called into the room. I sat down with a doctor. He took one look at me. Um, and then the next thing I remember is waking up on a hospital bed inside Queen Mary's with about 20 people around me, um, literally having all sorts of things um, told to me and can't stay calm, breathe and all this. And um, I was blue lighted there um, from there to the um, the Pro in um, in Alpington. Um, and then on the in the ambulance journey, I collapsed there and I woke up three and a half weeks later um, in, from an induced coma that they had to put me into to save my life. So obviously, you know, and and for the people that you you woke up and thought, well, you know, what's going on? But yeah. In that three three and a half weeks, you know, like I said, I I, I went and see your your, your, your dad and I, I met your mum. What 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 were they told in that time? So basically, uh, when I arrived at the Pru, um, the first thing that they needed to do was to get as much antibiotics into my system as possible. Um, someone at the Pru um, diagnosed it as um, as sepsis, um, and obviously the the key was to get antibiotics. But there were so many stories my mum and dad were told. My mum was told. My mum and dad were told that. Um, I had leukemia at one point, which was misdiagnosed. Um, and they were told uh, that I had a 10% chance to make it through um, and that they should start preparing for the worst. That's what they were told. Um, so I don't know how any sort of parent or family would deal with that information. Um, I'm sure it was just all a bit overwhelming at the time from nothing, literally from nothing, being fit and healthy the day before, feeling a little bit groggy, but everyone does every now and again. And then being told a day later that your son's got a 10% chance of making it um it was just a huge shock i think for everyone mate i think uh, i think you'll you'll know yourself it was just uh the whole that everyone i knew just went into a bit of a meltdown really and couldn't believe it had happened and um yeah that's what they were told i'd have a 10 percent chance to live and um they should start preparing for my funeral and obviously for no you know, any any parent at, at, at such a young age when you're feeling fine you, you just don't know so obviously you know you managed to get through you proved everyone wrong and, and the sepsis but what happened when you woke up I woke up in um, in Kings, funnily enough. In um, they they moved me from the Pru to Kings, um, and I woke up in Kings. Um, really, mum, mum, dad, and sister were by my bedside when I woke up, which was nice. And um, I think it was just a case, really, of them trying to explain to me what had happened and what my body had gone through. I mean, uh, sure, like many people, I didn't know what sepsis was. I didn't have a clue about it. Never heard of it before. 
this happened to me. Um, I thought it was something that you you normally got from a cut or something like that or a blood blood infection. Didn't think it was something that you could commonly just get through um, from nothing. Um, and still to this day, uh, the doctors are the, the doctors are absolutely bemused about why they why I've got it. They still can't tell me how I got it or why I got it. Um, there's a lot of people that are working on it and a lot of people that have got their opinions, but they can't. But yeah, going back to what you said, I woke up in Kings, had my my parents by my bedside, and they all. They all um, were sort of just telling me what had happened, really, Keith. And I was in I was in complete shock. Couldn't believe it. Couldn't, could not believe it. But they did say to me that um, when I woke up that I've been one of the lucky ones and I was going to I was going to make it through unscathed. That's what I was told at first um, by everyone around me. The doctors included sort of said, you're going to make it through. Yeah, you're going to have a, a few scars. And obviously I was black and blue, as you can imagine. I had uh, I had my, my skin had gone a little bit necrotic from all the um, antibiotics that were pumped into my system. So I had, I had really damaged tissue on my feet, on my hands, on my face at the time, on my nose. Um, but it wasn't anything that they were concerned about um, when I first uh, when I first woke up. How would you deal with that as a 20 odd year old, Joe? What's going through your mind? First thing that went through my mind, to be honest with you, was about my coaching company. Um, I know that might seem a mad thing to say, but you know yourself, Keith, you run your own business and... Um, it's one of those things that sometimes without yourself involved, it, it can fall flat. And that was the first, that was my first concern. How long am I going to be out for? And is it going to affect JMF? Because there's a lot of kids that we coach over a thousand kids a week. And I was more worried about them being affected by it, to be honest with you. Um, and I sort of said that straight away when I woke up, what's happening with, what's happening with my coaching company? I said that to mum and dad and they were like, don't worry, it's all taken care of. And uh, luckily enough, there was a lot of people that, um, that come to help me with that. And, uh, but yeah, that was my main concern. And then obviously the second thoughts are, am I going to be okay uh what's the long-term damage of this what 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 can happen and uh obviously at the time it, it wasn't anything but positive you're going to make it through you're going to be all right um but yeah unfortunately later down the line um as I'll tell you in a bit it just um things seem to deteriorate for me which was a shame so like I said, you know, and, and, and I met your, your mum and dad, and obviously Lauren as well. Um, yeah. You know, that, I know your mum. They never left your bedside every no. single day, did they? They were there as, as, as parents are, but you know, mentally, um, it was, um, was unbelievable, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, honestly, um, my dad took my dad took it quite hard, Keith. If I'm honest with yeah, you, no. I with it. Um, I think there was a few occasions that he broke down, but my mum my, my had her moments, but she was a rock all the way through my mum. Absolute rock by my bedside 24-7 when I needed her. Um, and she was unbelievable. Um, obviously, Lauren as well. She's only young. Um, to see her brother go through something like that wouldn't have been nice. Um, and she was strong. She was strong as an ox. And um, yeah, the three of them, the three of them come together and they really, really got me through them initial few weeks where obviously you're scared and you don't know what's going to happen and you, you're in a new environment and they got me through them initial weeks until obviously all my friends and people could start to visit and that's when obviously uh, I spoke about it before the football community coming together for me was just something I'll never forget. Yeah so obviously you know you've, you've come through and you've been told a lot of positives and, and, and you're hoping and you're just thinking you're mostly just laying there thinking right okay as most of us hospitals sort me out I'm just going to yeah. walk out of here as, as, as I come in. That was well, it. That was it. Before. Yeah, literally. Um, the, the doctors and nurses kept telling me. They just said that you're, you've been lucky. You're gonna you're gonna make it out of here, and um, you, you've come. Pr you're pretty much unscathed, to be honest with you. Um, one of the nurses did mention to me, uh, and this is when all the story started. Really, she said to me, "You have got a couple of toes on your foot that have gone gone necrotic because of the amount of antibiotics that we've put into your system." And the worst case scenario, really, at this stage, is that you might have to have one or two toes amputated. Um, and I remember at the time I was joking about wearing flip flops and stuff on holiday. That's what that's the kind of spirit that I was in with it. You know what I mean? It wasn't too much of a concern after everything I've been through and been told that I was lucky to make it out uh, at the other side. So that wasn't a really a big concern to me. Um, but it was only further down the line that I started to hear the nurses and started to hear my mum talking to the nurses and things about my foot. Um, my left foot was getting better, but my right one just it, it, it didn't seem to be improving. And um that's when it got a little bit of a concern. And I start, you, you sort of get the vibe from the doctors and stuff that are looking at it. They can't help it. It's just their facial expressions and things like that. But I started to get the vibe that there's, there's something a little bit more serious going on here um, than what, what I'm being led to believe. And um, the tissue, vi the tissue viability nurse, Viv, come out and saw me. And, um, and again, she was really positive and said that you'll be OK. And that sort of made me think, oh, that's a relief. But yeah, um, I mean, it just didn't, it didn't get any better compared to the left one. And... Um, 
a few weeks down the line, um, they said to me that I was going to have to have an operation to debride the foot, which basically means take all of the dead skin off and see what's left. And I knew at that point that this was this was going to be a lot more serious um, than what we thought. And um, yeah, I went down to that operation that day um, and I remember saying to the surgeon as I went in, I got rolled in and I said to the surgeon, are you going to be able to save my foot? And he went to me, do you want me to be honest with you? And I said, yeah. And he said, um, he said, I'm going to do the very best I can, but it's going to be a difficult job. And I knew from that point onwards that this was going to be this was going to be a problem. And what's going through your mind mentally, Joe? Uh, everything, coaching, uh, am I going to be able to manage again? Am I going to be able to get out on the coaching pitch with the kids? Am I going to be able to work? Am I going to be able to earn an income? All that sort of stuff goes into your head as well as am I going to be able to socialise? Um, I didn't want to be in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. That's the automatically the first thing that comes into your head. You go from being um, one minute, being like being fully independent to realising that you're going to have to independ on it, be independent on everyone else. Because um, at, well, at this stage as well, Keith, I had no feeling in my... Uh, in my um from my neck downwards as well um so obviously all, all my nerves and stuff had gone completely so i was literally in a hospital bed laying there being told this news and i couldn't be i couldn't do anything about it so so many things flash through your head um but the main main ones were obviously am i going to be able to to go back to work that was that was the main sort of aim i have you know me keith i love my coaching i'm i'm fully involved in it and i coach every session that i can and that was the that was the scary thought that i might not be able to get back out there and do that I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned that, obviously, you, you missed a big pit art and you just got it, but that you didn't have any feeling from your neck down no. because, said when I come, well, even other people, like, you had to be fed, didn't you? You you basically could only move your lips and, and everything. You couldn't yeah. have your hands. You had to basically transform your whole body again, didn't you? Yeah, so basically the the, the nerves in, in my body died. So um, I had to, um, through the antibiotics and everything that were pumped into my system. So literally, um, yeah, the only thing the only thing I could move with my lips, I couldn't talk um, at the time. I had to have um, a tracheostomy um, to, to talk again. Uh, where they taught me to talk again, I had a, a little windmill in my mouth that used to go round and in my neck that used to go round and I could talk for five minutes, then 10 minutes and then build it up each day. Um, so that was to talk. And then the feeling in my arms slowly started to come back, although it took a while. Um, but at this point, I was still I couldn't move my head off the pillow, as you know. And, uh, yeah, I was basically paralyzed from the neck down, to be honest with you. So everyone had to do everything for me. I had to be fed. I had to be turned on the bed so I didn't get sores. I had to be washed. It, it was just, and as a bloke, Keith, as well, it, it was, it wasn't nice. You know what I mean? You don't, you don't like people doing all that for you, and you, you just wanted, to, I wanted to be independent, and I hate, I hated every minute of that. That was the, that was the, probably the toughest bit, having to have everything, everyone do everything for me. As much as a luxury as that probably sounds to a lot of people, it was, uh, it was horrible being having to sit there and um, basically, yeah, get, get everyone do everything. Obviously, I know you well, and and, and we're, we're going to keep bouncing back forward. Obviously. Just with your dad there, obviously, I see. I remember, you know, I, I come and visit you when you when you was in intensive care, and and you yeah. were there, and and you said about your dad, and and he come up to me and burst into tears. But you, you know, you couldn't communicate, and 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 like you said, you you were well, and Lauren, but a mate, you know, you, your dad loved his football, but you, you were major mm. part of his life, and you know that more than more than anyone. Yeah. Um, and obviously, I don't want to, I've sort of upset you with that, but. No. How was how was you know just tell me what what sort of, your dad was like a communication for you wasn't he he was like uh, uh, it hit him massively but he was he was you know massive for you wasn't he yeah huge huge influence when I was in hospital um, he, he he as you know he communicated with everyone else on my behalf for me basically while I was there. Uh, via Facebook and um, he let everyone know my updates every day whether it was the fact that I'd, I'd winked or moved my lip or anything anything big or small he was um, he was letting everyone know which was great because obviously all my friends didn't know what happened Keith I just went off the radar as you can imagine they, they didn't, didn't hear from me for two three weeks it was only obviously um, the, the ones close to me that realized what happened so there was a lot of people that didn't know so he let everyone know for me and I think in a way it was his coping mechanism as well I think it helped him to cope a little bit better because he was struggling as you know he was really emotional with it he went and he went out with a few of my mates a couple of times and broke down and uh, yeah he, he um, I think that's how he coped in the end by just letting people know what was going on day to day with me hour to hour to be honest with you mm. so obviously you know you, we bounce back to yourself again so you're having this problem with, with obviously your foot and they've done this operation. Take us on again, Joe. So basically, um, I went down for the surgery on me uh, on my foot um, and uh, they debrided the foot, took all the way dead skin. 
Um, and I remember waking up in the um, in the room where obviously everyone wakes up after their operation, and um, I was giving, being given pain relief and all that. But although I was out of it, I could I could hear the nurses that were looking at my foot at the end of the bed talking, and I knew that what they were saying wasn't positive. I could tell it um, from what they were saying. I, I could just make it out. It's just one of them weird things that I, I sort of just got the gist that it, it weren't right. And uh, I remember them bandaging it up and I went up to my room and I remember um, they said to me that there's a there's a lady called Dr. Rose that's going to come and see you. She's a plastic surgeon and she's going to come and uh, explain what the next steps are. And um, that night, my mum was with me all that day and that night I went to sleep um, and uh, I, for some reason I woke up um, in the middle of the night screaming and uh, probably a concoction of all the drugs that I was on and everything like that but uh, I, just, I, just, I had a premonition I had a premonition that it was going to be um, it was going to be bad and uh, all of a sudden I got to started saying I started out, I'm going to cut my leg off they're going to take my leg they're going to do this they're going to do that so it was a weird one and then um, my mum had to come up in the middle of that night to calm me down and they give me another drug to calm me down and uh, I fell asleep and um, yeah the next morning I woke up Dr. Rose come and saw me. Um, she walked in and a um, lovely woman. Um, she explained that the operation had revealed that um, there was not enough tissue um, to basically make the foot reconstructable. Um, my other foot would be fine, which was good news. Um, she did say to me that, that she started off actually the conversation by saying, look, I can save your foot. And I looked at my mum and I went like sigh of relief. And, um, and then she said, but, and when she said that, but I knew that it was going to be bad news. And that's when she come out with the fact that it was just too far gone for it to, to be salvageable to walk on again. And if she saved it, it would be more the fact that it would just be there to look at rather than use, um, which for me was devastating, as you can imagine, burst into tears. And, uh, it was from that point, then I realized that I was looking at, I was looking at an amputation and, uh, and then she come out with it and said, your second option is to have an amputation, um, and if you have that, you'll be walking again within three months. And uh, when she said that to me, it was um, it was horrible, obviously. Um, but at the same time, in the back of my head, I, I just knew that I had to um, I had to basically grit my teeth. And um, that was the that was the news that I was dealt, unfortunately, on that day. How long did it take you to make your decision, Joe? Just for people that well, there was a friend of mine actually. A funny story. Um, a friend of mine, Liam McGarry. Um, come to visit me on the day that I was told the news. He didn't know. He lived in um, he lived in Bournemouth. He was at university, and he drove down to come and see me. And um, for those that don't know, Liam, um, the year before, had a bad um, had a bad accident, an unfortunate accident, um, and damaged his back. And um, he was paralysed from the waist down. And it just seems weird that he come and see me that day. He chose that day to come and see me because there I was sitting in in that hospital bed, being told that um, I was going to have to have my leg amputated, but if all goes well, you'll be able to walk again. Um, and there was him sitting there that weren't ever going to have that opportunity again. He was paralysed from the waist down. So that was a huge help. That was a really huge help. I sat and spoke to him for an hour or two on my own without my mum and dad and that there. And uh, he, he come out with um, a phrase and he just said to me, look, he said, I would take what you've been given, the blow you've been given over what I've been dealt seven days a week. And when he said that to me, it just made me think a little bit like, yeah, you're right, a little. You're right, mate. Like, I, I can still do this. I can still get out and about. I'll still be on my feet. It, it's not the end of the world. Whereas for him, I know it's still not the end of the world. He's still about, gets about, but he's in a wheelchair permanently. You know what I mean? And uh, I was being given that chance again to walk, which he he couldn't have. And that inspired me to make the decision a lot quicker. I would say it probably took me two days, two days to make the decision, mould it over. Um, but yeah, I, it was it was quite a quick decision in the end, Keith. I was in hospital at that point for about probably three months so I was just looking to get out as quick as I could if I'm honest with you I just wanted to do everything within my power to get out as quick as possible so I see you made a decision and yeah made the decision uh, they booked me in for my um, operation um, in July so yeah went to I was moved from King's to St Thomas's um, they give me the um, give me all my injections to put me asleep uh, went down for the operation um, they worked on me for nine and a half hours. Um, and yeah, then I woke up in the recovery room with, with no leg. So, um, obviously that was, that was quite shocking. I remember it was, uh, they propped it up at the time. They propped obviously what was left of my leg up at the time. And it was weird looking down at the sheets and seeing your whole leg there on your other side and then seeing that bit, bit missing. And that's when it hit me and I broke down a little bit after in the, in the recovery room and I did get upset and, uh, 
obviously that's when it it really hit me that this has happened and um, my life as I knew it weren't ever going to be the same again as much as I can get back to normal and I will it weren't ever going to be the same again Joe I mean listening to that listening to where you're up to so far you just it's, it's absolutely incredible uh, but I mean was you actually told, you know, when, when you had to go down for the operation, sort of how much of the leg they were going to take away? They said to me that it was going to be a below knee amputation. Um, and then they said that obviously they, what they do is they work up the leg um, and then they will take away what they need to, um, still leaving as much as possible for them to work with um, in order for me to obviously have, a, and have, a, have an active lifestyle after it. I mean, I, I know it's a mad thing to say. Uh, obviously, I got my leg amputated. It's not lucky, but I was lucky in a way that I didn't have a, a above knee amputation because that's a whole different ball game in terms of your rehab and getting back to normal and getting back to work. Because then you're looking at a prosthetic limb that needs to bend and things like that. Um, so yeah, I, I was, I was, I was. Even though I was dealt this blow, I, I, I come out a bit lucky in the fact that I didn't, I, I didn't have to have a above knee amputation and it was below. But um, yeah, when I compare my two legs together. Um, it's, it's it's not it's not too much that they've taken off. It's around the shin area, really, that it, it sort of uh, it comes to an end. So you know, I know it's easy for you to say you're lucky, and people who are watching this thinking bloody hell. Mm. But you know, you you did have to rewalk it. You know, you, you didn't. You haven't just had to rewalk again. You've had to re- you had, had to use your arms, your fingers, talk, yeah. get up, build, Every, so then have your leg cut off, and then start again. Yeah, basically, because um, then your body's in body's in recovery mode. Um, obviously, you're, you're you're tired every day. Your body's getting used to this this uh, this big operation that you've just had. Um, and yeah, it, it did take me a while to get to get back to back to myself before, like I was before the operation. If I'm honest with you, um, but yeah, I mean the nurses and the nurses and the doctors and the physios were just different level, Keith. If I'm honest with you, I mean. I'll never forget the day after my operation. I remember the physio bouncing in and saying to me, "Right, up you get. You've got you got to attempt some sit ups." And I'm sitting there thinking, "What? I've just had my leg cut off, right?" And he's like, "No, we, you get working straight away." And they did. They were like that, and they were in two or three times a day working with me. If, if I couldn't move because I was tired, they were they were stretching me or they were moving my body for me, moving my knee joints. They were they were getting me back moving again. And um, yeah, the work didn't stop. It was it was it was full on um, until I, I obviously eventually went to the rehab centre. Um, but there was a little lapse that I had. Um, so I come out of the operation. I was probably about a week into recovery, a week or two into recovery, and um, started to get a few pains around the chest area um told the doctors reported it they said it's nothing to worry about it might just be stress blah 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 and it just got worse and worse and worse and I remember feeling a little bit like I felt before I got ill um but the the pain was pain was really bad and um it was my mum was with me at the time and uh, she went and got a nurse and by the time they both come back into the room that was me again unconscious and I remember I remember everything exactly as it happened before when I fell out of consciousness. I mean, they say that your life flashes before your eyes before you go. And I can tell you now, I know it might seem a bit far-fetched, but it does. You, all the images come flashing through your head when you go into a, into a state of shock. And before I know it, I was being rushed down to ICU. I'd caught pneumonia on the ward and I was back down to ICU after my leg operation fighting for my life again. Um, and luckily enough, the doctors the doctors worked their magic again and got me to come back round. But my mum again was told when I was when she was in that room that it, it was it was going to be touch and go again. Um, so yeah, not for a first time, but for a second time. So I, I, God knows what she was feeling at that point. Jeez. I mean, we you know you've, you've gone through this, and we you know what you've gone through is unbelievable. Um, but your family to to have three, four, five things happen to you, you know, and it's, and and you're the kid. It's it's unbelievable. Like I said, I know the support you've got um, uh, has been unbelievable at, at the football community, and, um, and I know you know that, and, it, and it's carried on. But how do you cope as a family? They were just so strong, mate. Um, again, I go back to my mum. I can't speak highly enough of her. Really, she was just so strong through the whole thing. Um, a lot of people, it would have probably it would have probably crushed. You know what I mean? But they just seem to get stronger and stronger. The more the worse and worse I've got, they seem to get stronger and stronger. And I think they knew deep down that. I'd got through the worst of it. Um, and obviously if I could have got through that, I can get through all the little bits and pieces that come with it. So they were positive all the way through, but listen, they have their moments, Keith, Dave, they had their moments. They were, they were sitting there and, you know what I mean? At times burst out crying. I remember my dad come and see me on my hospital bed once after me up, just after I fell with pneumonia actually. And he come and see me and he, he just couldn't believe it. He just sat down and said, I just can't believe this has happened to you. But listen, 
they, they were strong for me. They, they, we, we're quite a, we're lucky, really, in the fact that we are a little bit strong around these sorts of things, and that's obviously got us through. Obviously, especially the last three months with Dad. So, yeah, um, quite blessed, really. Obviously, you know, you, you, then you we're skipping a little bit. You you, you, yeah. you you get home, you come home, and you have to rebuild yeah. your life. Um, yeah. Then what happens? So yeah, uh, come up. I was at the rehab centre. Uh, got to the rehab centre in September. Um, come out of the rehab centre. Works there every day of the week, different classes, variety of classes and stuff. Learned to walk again on a new prosthetic limb, um, which was really hard work. Obviously, my body had done nothing. And I remember standing up for the first time in, in six months and uh, I had to sit back down again because my body just couldn't handle it. I was physically shaking. Gem gently built myself up day after day. They were amazing at the rehab centre. Uh, learned to walk again, first on two crutches, then on one crutch and then... Um, eventually I learned to walk on no crutches but yeah I got, when I was in the rehab centre I mean dad come and visited me a couple of times um, and he, he, he didn't moan moan's the wrong word but he just mentioned that he, he had a pain in his leg um, which was unlike him the old man never moaned about things like that he was always quiet you know what I mean brass about things and just got on with it but he kept moaning that he had a little pain in his leg and um, we, we, at the time when we were in the rehab uh, he was just saying like, what I think he drives for a living as you know Keith my dad he's a chauffeur and uh, he um, he just thought it was a chauffeur's like a driving injury he just thought it was where he was on and off the clutch all the time or you know what I mean moving his feet around and, and he didn't think nothing of it and it was only really when I got home I got home in um, October and uh, we had about a month and a half and he kept complaining about it and it was only around Christmas time that we sort of said to him look if that's really giving you jip you need to go and get that checked out um and he said, yeah, I will after Christmas. And um, I think he had an appointment on the 27th or something like that, day after Boxing Day. He went up to, um, went up to the hospital and uh, got it checked out. And um, at first, they said to him that it was a, a deep vein thrombosis was what they, they said it was, um, DVP and um, DVT, sorry. And, uh, yeah, obviously, um, they said to him to come back in the new year. Um, they give him some painkillers and off he went. My dad being my dad didn't complain about nothing. Uh, then it got to the new year and he was still in a lot of pain with it. And um, he went back, I think, January again. They'd done more tests on him, said that they'd have the results back in a couple of weeks. That seemed to go on three weeks, four weeks. And then the results come back and it was, can you come in for an appointment? And I think it was mid-Feb that he went in for an appointment. And they said that we've, uh, we've located it and we've spotted that it is a sarcoma. Um, cancer on the leg um, in your thigh area um, but the PET scan that we've done has also shown up spots on your liver and lung um, and uh, it was it was then that they told him that he'd have um, 18 to 20 months to live um, so he goes from this pain in his leg uh, one minute no concern about it to being told that he had 18 to 20 months to live at his next appointment which obviously and, yeah. and how, how long how long was that since you come home, Joe? I come home in October, and he was dealt that news in February, so three or four months, yeah. I'm real. So, what what are you thinking as a family? Obviously, with yourself, and and again, you know, what, what, was there times that you you felt bitter and angry and? Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, I, I couldn't work out what was going on. Um, I don't know why. Uh, don't, we still don't know, and it's just it's just life, in it. But I was angry at the fact that. It had happened to me. I was angry at the fact that he was now being told this. Um, but we was always positive with him because um, the hospital said, you've got 18 to 20 months. Um, that's that's what you've got. But we're going to give you chemo. And with chemo, you can go on for years. So we took that stance with him um, all the way up until his first chemo treatment. He was upset, obviously. I've got this long to live. But I said, yeah, but... They give you that long, but you've got to, you've got to look at the positive side of it. If this chemo works, you you could go on for years. It might even cure it. You know what I mean? You, you don't know until you've had the chemo. Um, and yeah, obviously we led up to this chemo appointment. And to be fair, the old man was he took it in his stride really at that, them early stages, and he was quite determined. Even though he had his bad days, he was quite determined when he went to that first chemo point, uh, appointment that he was going to beat it. Um, and we got him there, and uh, yeah. Um, for whatever reason, the, the chemo didn't seem to have a uh, have any effect on him. And uh, we've actually been told since he passed that the chemo could have made things worse. But that was a chance that he had to take, you know what I mean? And um, he um, he went to that chemo appointment. And to be honest with you, after that chemo appointment, he was just never the same. Never the same after that um, in terms of his mental state, in terms of the way that he was acting. He was really down. Could, it was talking a lot of gibberish. And... Um, 
he went back to another appointment after his chemo a couple of weeks later and um, the nurses just took one look at him and said to my mum that we're going to need to take you into a room. They took my mum into a room and they explained to her that the, the cancer had um, grown at a rapid rate and um, the 18 to 20 months that he was given was now more two to three months. Um and that was just that was just heartbreaking. That was just heartbreaking, mate. Um, you just go from your dad, your hero, someone that you've been around every day of your life, to uh, to start having this fact in your head that he ain't going to be here in three months' time. And um, I, I, I sort of knew in the back of my head that it would be a lot quicker than three months. I felt it was going to be a lot quicker than three months through the way that he was acting and stuff. And uh, I think me, mum, my sister, deep down knew that he wasn't he wasn't going to last for those three months that they had predicted. Um, but that crushed him. That crushed him. If I'm honest with you, that news probably finished him in terms of his mental well-being. Um, from that point onwards, it was um, it was doom and gloom. Um, as you can imagine, I can't imagine anyone being told that news. You know what I mean? Like, how do you how do you deal with that news? He rang me and told me, and I was like, "What?" Yeah. And, you know, and it's like just Harry, and then I don't know. He put it on social media, but mm-hmm. um, you know, just just with the cancer, but it, 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 it was a rare cancer, isn't it? Yeah, really rare rare form of sarcoma i couldn't tell you the name it's got too many m's in it and too many i's and but it's um it's a really rare form of cancer that he had uh, a sarcoma cancer in his thigh um that has spread to his liver and lungs um and it was just growing at a rapid rate so rapid that they couldn't control it um and yeah it caught up with him in the end so they they tell you he's got two or three months when, when was this year? this is this is lockdown time in it yeah, so this was um, end of probably mid March, end of March, where they told him this. Um, and uh, straight away, my mum said to me that um, her, her words were in a way that they killed him that day that they told him. Um, by law, they have to tell you apparently that um, how long you've got left, um, obviously, so you can prepare yourself and stuff like that. But after that day, he just went downhill rapidly. Keith um, didn't want to talk to anyone, didn't want to, didn't want to associate with anyone. Wanted to lay in bed all the time and. There's me and Lauren sort of saying to him, look, come on, let's get out of bed, let's spend some time together, blah, blah, blah. But he just didn't want to do any of it for that initial week. And then and then what happened was, which was quite sad, really, is that the, the cancer took over in the end and he physically couldn't couldn't do anything himself. Um, he was he was he was bedridden. Um, we had to get him downstairs in a hospital bed, as you know. Oh. Um, and obviously we, we knew that when he when he got brought downstairs, the day the ambulance come to bring him downstairs because he couldn't move. They had to bring him out of bed upstairs and, and move him to the bed downstairs. And we knew that that day that when he got put down here that he wouldn't um, he wouldn't be getting out of that bed again and that was that was a that was a that was heartbreaking you know my dad Keith he was fit active well not yeah. fit active he used to be around and he used to love socializing with everyone you know what I mean and this especially this time of year with everything that's going on it was just a shame that um in the circumstances that he couldn't get out in those final days and go and see people that he probably would have liked to have seen you know what I mean but like I said in the end it was just um it was just the fact of um him being bedridden unfortunately so with, with, with in the space when they told you that he had two three months, how long did 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 did, did that last? So from the uh, diagnosis at the end of March, um, he was he was diagnosed at the end of March. Um, yeah, so probably I'm I'm thinking a week, maybe a month and uh, three weeks, um, something along those lines, a month and three weeks from the three months that he was given. But it was just deterioration every day. It was deterioration every single day of the week, and that's. He was in hospital for for probably out of that month and a half. He was probably in hospital for three three weeks at that time, four weeks at that time, um, and the deterioration every day. It went from him being able to text me to not be able to text me, from him being able to watch his films on his iPad to not being able to do that. Then he couldn't lift his phone, um, and then he was talking deliriously, uh, couldn't make sense of anything he was saying, um, and then it got to a point where. The hospital basically said, look, we've done everything in our power that we can now. Um, it, it, it's really now time for him to spend with you now. And he's um, in the final time that he's got left with you. And mum was quite an advocate of getting him home, as was I. I thought that would be good for him. Um, but initially, it was really hard work, Keith. It was really hard work. He, 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 it, was, it was horrible to see. You know what I mean? You just see a, you see a bloke that's just deteriorating in front of your eyes, basically. And uh, it's not nice for anyone. There was He, he, didn't, like, he didn't like to be waited on he didn't like people doing anything for him he was quite an independent bloke and uh, yeah in the final stages he fell apart which was just it was horrible to watch you know what I mean and we had to see that every day in the end I, I took myself out of the situation and um, I used to spend a little bit of time by myself I went and see him obviously of course I did and sat with him and stuff but it was just too hard for me to sit there every 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 hour of every day with him because there were days that he were good that he could talk and then there were days that he, he wouldn't know who I was and that was that was a shame and that was horrible to see how are you mentally though, Joe, with that? Because 
you know, with all that, you know, what's going on, and we're talking weeks, you're still recovering yourself. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's an odd one. You sort of, you sort of put yourself into a mindset where, what, what I did anyway, I put myself into a mindset that, look, right, you've got your, you've got your own things going on. You need to deal with what you've got going on, and um, obviously. What happened with the greatest respect? And I don't mean this horrible, but you've got a, you've just got to be there for dad and be there for the family. But you've still got to worry about yourself because um, it's mad. If I forget to take a tablet or something, Keith, that could be me back in hospital. You know yeah. what? So That's what I mean, I, you're not yeah. out of the woods, are you? you know, no, by a long shot, I've still got a long way to go. Good, good few years probably. But um, I needed to make sure that at the same time as looking after myself, that I was there for Lauren, that I was there for my mum, and obviously my dad as well in his final stages. Like you said, Keith, we were really close, and every time I walked into the room in the bed, he's, he's face lit up, you know what I mean? And, um, yeah, I, I won't forget all of them sort of things. But, yeah, mentally, mentally, I don't know how. I don't know whether it's something in me. I, I don't know where I've got it from. I really don't. But I mentally cope with it, um, and I was, I was able to get on with it, and I was able to talk like I am today. I didn't think I would. I, I, I didn't think I would be able to do anything like this, but somehow someone's given me the strength from somewhere to um, to talk about things. And um, yeah, and I feel like, would be the same. Yeah, it would be. Yeah, hundred percent. So yeah, I mean, um, that's where I'm at at the moment. Um, I'm still recovering, of course. Um, this has obviously had a had a big effect on me uh, mentally, but. Yeah, he's going to be weird and getting to adjust into him not being around. Of course, it is. Um, but he wouldn't want me. He wouldn't want me to be wor- uh, wallowing in it, Keith. He wouldn't want me to be sitting there feeling sorry for myself. Um, he'd say, "Get on with your life, boy." That, that was his motto. You know what I mean? So that's what I intend to do. Listen, mate, your your, your strength is unreal, and, and your mum's strength is even more. So I want I want to finish. I can't say I can, I'm going to finish on a positive, right? Yeah. But let's, let's talk about your dad. Let's, yeah. let's tell everyone how great he was, mm-hmm. what his passion was. Yeah. Um, so there's going to be people out there going, fuck it. Anyway, he was a, you know, <laughs> he, he, he ran me up. Um, yeah. But, you know, that was Martin. And that's why people loved him. Um, yeah. t- 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 we've spoke about your career. Let's talk about your dad because, you know, I'm the VCD manager now. Yeah. Your dad is and was Mr. VCD. Yeah. Don't care what anyone says, and anyone know that he took a club from not Sunday morning football, but the ground itself to yeah. where it, where it it, it, it was. You yeah. know, he, he spent every minute. You as a family, let's let's talk about the pluses and and the, yeah. and the great times that your dad did. Oh, he had so many. He had so many. Um, he joined he joined VCD back in 1993-94 season, I believe. They were a Kent County club. I'm not sure if he they had a good football career as well, didn't he? Yeah, really good career. Really good career. He um he played he played as a youngster at Cholton. Um, broke his leg twice, so he was unlucky not to make it. A lot of people tell. Obviously, I never saw him play, but a lot of people tell me he was a very good player. And in different circumstances, he, he might well have made it, which is it's nice to hear. You know what I mean? He's, he's had comparisons to some great players, and um, obviously grew up with Tommy Warrillow and Dave Soul and people like that who were, who all played with him. And he was at Maidstone. He was in the in the side that got promoted to the league. Um, and then obviously um. Yeah, he um he went into he went down the managerial route after he stopped playing. Um, joined VCD in 1993-94. Like I said, I think they were in the Kent County Division One or Premier, one of the two. I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, but yeah, took took VCD to a, a different level. To be honest with you, from what they were at, um, everyone I talked to, all of his old players, just said that he was just so he was so professional in what he'd done with everything in terms of the layout of the dressing room that completely changed a lot of the players said it used to be you put the kit bag in the middle of the floor everyone took their stuff out and, and from that he, he started hanging up shirts and putting programs on people's pegs and he set the, he set the way really down there and um, and, and sort of I, I always say what he done he done Keith was he, he put that he set the pathway for that club to go on to what they've uh, sort of achieved I think he took it as far as he could take it in terms of his his managerial thing in the end and um, as we all know it weren't a nice last year at the club but but yeah. it, it was one of them things and um he, he left and i think he could leave with his, his his head held high after everything that he achieved there you know what i mean so he won i think he won the kent county premier league uh won the treble the first year he was there i think they didn't win the league though that year and then the second year they won the double and went up into the kent in, from the kent county league into the now into the then kent league um 
I think it was the Brewers Kent League or something back then, mate. That it was, mate. Yeah, Bombers. Brewers, we yeah. had Bombers and Brewers. Yeah, it was. Um, and he went back into that, and um, yeah, I think he just steadily started building sides that were competitive, mate. As you know, he didn't have a wage budget in his in his early years there. I think it weren't until the last two, three years he was there. He had a little bit of a wage budget, um, but yeah, just sort of built the built the club up. I remember being down there, Keith, when they were building the ground. I know it seems mad putting the surrounds around the original uh-huh. pitch that was there before it got turned around. I remember the pavilion um, was there, but it was it was mainly a cricket pavilion with two massive open changing rooms. And I remember my granddad, then my dad, other people like that, all spending days down there working on this pavilion, putting up like the, probably the walls that are still stand just about stand today. I know it's all getting done up now, but um, yeah. And I remember being down there painting it. I remember painting the pavilion myself as a, as a five six year old kid. You know what I mean? So um, yeah, there's a lot of history down at VCD, mate. I grew up there, and this. Um, Every time I look back on it, I always look back with smiles. I, I forget about that last year he was there. What happened happened, and ultimately, yeah, that what went on went on, and uh, I'll, that'll be that'll be something that I talk about at a later date. But he um, he's Mr. VCD, like you said, mate. And um, yeah, I think I think it all I think it all um, sort your of whole family through. lived there, Joe, didn't they? Your mum, yeah, we, you were there every day. 24-7. I remember getting home from school, getting home from school, and my dad, my mum would be like, do you want to go down to VCD? That's where dad is. Yeah, no problem. Drop me down there. I was there for the evening, getting home at 11, 12 o'clock at night, getting up for the next school the next day with matchsticks in my eyes. That was my, that was my life, you know what I mean? And uh, Yeah, I, I played in all the youth teams up there, as you know, Keith, played in all the youth teams up there under him, from under 7 to under 16 until I come and joined you. And um, Yeah, no, listen... Uh, so there's, there's too many good times up there that I can that I can talk about. There's just so many. You know what I mean? I remember you remember it, Keith. The bar was packed every weekend, wasn't it? You know what I mean? He had he just got the club buzzing on on all fronts. You know what I mean? And it, it, the, the Vars run, the Vars run that we had when we went to Camel Laird. Oh, yeah. that was, that was amazing. I think I was 15 at the time, 14, 15. Right, the Everton's ground, didn't they? Yeah, he, he he made some phone calls like he did. The old man got himself busy, rung someone at Everton and. Uh, Spoke to a kit man, I think, there. And then the next thing you know, we're, we're all training at Everton's training ground the night before the game. You know what I mean? Being treated like royalty there. It was unbelievable. It's like they rolled the red carpet out for the team. And we went and done a tour of the ground. And then we went to Liverpool's ground and we done a tour there. And to be fair, they should have beat Camel Laird that day. They had a goal disallowed in the last minute. Gretz got a goal disallowed in the last minute. It was never offside. And uh, if he had equalised, I think they would have gone on to win the game because they were looking the stronger team. But Camel Laird were a false. They were a real false that year. And uh, they were a good side. But yeah, I'll never forget that. We've got the England coach up there as well. It's, it's all just happy memories, mate. That's all That's all I keep looking back to, to be honest with you. Every time I think of him, I smile. You know what I mean? All the, all the memories down there. Even with yourself, Keith. I, I remember being down there so young, watching your youth team play on the side pitch. You know what I mean? And Nick Nick Davis, Lee Loveridge, all those sort of players coming through. And I don't forget it, mate. I remember everything up there. You know what I mean? So, yes, yeah, it's, 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 I can look back on that place with happy memories, mate. Joe, no, no. I've, got, I've, got, I've, got to, I've got to read out some of these messages because some of these messages that are yeah. coming in, I'll, 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 be, I'll be openly honest with you, mate. I've not said much because I've let Keith, you know, have it because he knows you well and, and knows the story. Yeah. But, but for me, mate, absolutely, absolutely incredible you coming on tonight and actually talking about it and an absolute inspiration, mate, I'll be honest with you. But, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll read some of these out. Some of the names you may well know and some you might not. But uh, Kevin Watson's come through and said, absolutely inspirational, Joe. Uh, Chris Sotterway, the chairman at Harlow Town, has said, uh, what mental strength you have, Joe. Uh, Keith's mum's just giving you a love up. Uh, <laughs> Peter, Peter Bale has come on and said, totally got my respect. Very brave coming on and talking so open and, and honest. Uh, Tom Smith said, well done, Joe. You're a true fighter, mate, and an inspiration. Uh, Martin Hill has said, uh, amazing interview. Uh, Robert, Smith, uh, Robert Smith said, great interview, Joe. Dad would be proud. Uh, Mark Weaver said he should be so proud. Uh, one that's just come in, uh, John John Mann, I see your... Mate, you should know who Mane is, Dave, bloody hell. Uh, I see you, your hat-trick, Joe. Yeah, he did. Probably one of the rare ones where I scored, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But, I mean, the story, Joe, I mean, for you to come on and actually talk about it, and, you know, and I know, you know, with your dad as well, it's it's still very raw and, and, and saying he's just incredible, mate. I mean, you've spoken tonight. I mean, I've just sat here as a, as a viewer, as anybody else, and just sitting there listening to you, and and, it, it, and it's just absolutely inspirational, my friend. I, funny, I funny, funny story about Kevin Watson, actually. Um, obviously, the day, the couple of days after I fell ill, um, Cray Valley, actually, uh, a couple of days after I woke up, um, Cray Valley won the league. Yeah, I remember this. And he was at his, um, he was at his, uh, he'll get, he'll get the ump me, keep saying it, but um, he was at his party, obviously celebrating that they've won the league. And obviously, he heard the news that I'd fallen ill. 
and he drove. He left his he left his um his party that he was at where they were celebrating winning the league. He left early and he, he went and met my dad and give him his league winners medal to pass on to me in hospital. I just thought that was such a touch of class from Kev. You know what I mean? There was no there was no need for him to do that. You know what I mean at all. But I thought that that says a lot about the man. You know what I mean? And we've been in touch ever since. And um, yeah, I'm really grateful that he, he done that. And that's something that I'll, I'll never ever forget. You know what I mean? Just to leave obviously a scene like that where you're obviously ju- rejuvenating over what you've just done. You know what I mean? But to leave that and come and come and care for me the way he did, I think it says a lot about the man. So yeah, I won't ever forget that. So cheers, Kevin. Uh, Gary, Andrews, Gary, Andrews, cool. so Gary Andrews is just coming, it's still flying in now, Joe. I mean, I've never seen anything quite like this since we've been doing the show. But Gary Andrews has come in and said, good to see you today, Joe. Stay true to yourself and the family, mate. Uh, Lee Thomas has said, an inspiration to everyone you know, Joe. And Adam Marsh has said, legend, legend 40. Marshy. Yeah, no, Gary Andrews popped round today telling me the story about how he lifted the Kent County League title, oh, Keith. Oh. Keith. Pictures of it, Joe. We keep telling him he didn't really play too much in the Kent League, though. But he's going to maybe come back and say, "I'm going to get the sack and all that." As he keeps going on, but <laughs> lovely man, Gal. And um, is it, Mark, is it, is it, is it a lot of people are Joe, as, as you know, um, obviously me included. But um, the, the support, just, just say a little bit. I know you want to and you have, but the support that, that, that have you been shocked? What's not just with yourself, but also with with, with, with your dad. Initially with me, I was gobsmacked at the support that I got. Um, I've got to be honest with you. Um, I, I was totally gobsmacked with it. Um, and then even more so with my old man. Um, absolutely. It's just, it's been unbelievable, Keith. Like when I say that my phone hasn't stopped mm. I, and people say that as a phrase, I mean, my phone has not stopped. Like literally it is beeping like 24 seven through the day, through the night. Um, people sending flowers, people popping around the, like popping around the house and making sure we're all right. It's just all, it's all been so overwhelming. It really has. You know what I mean? I think I spent, I left my phone on charge for an hour the other day and come back to 758 Twitter notifications on my phone. Um, just through people that were tweeting him, you know what I mean? That was just after an hour. And, um, yeah, it was, it's just been incredible, mate. And I, I honestly, I can't thank anybody enough. Like I said to you before, it'd be unfair of me to name any individuals, Keith, because, even even the little messages get, help get you through, you know what I mean? And when I have my down moments, I look down their messages and see just how many people's lives that he's touched, you know what I mean? And uh, and that 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 obviously makes you proud, you know what I mean? A proud son to uh, to look at all of that. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's been really emotional looking through them, I won't lie to you, but I think that it's been a, it's been a big coping mechanism for me, getting back to people, make, saying thank you. And even when I was going through my recovery, um, thanking people and... Uh, yeah, and it also gives you a little bit of a point to prove to people, especially in my recovery. I wanted to prove to people that I could get back out there, mate. You know what I mean, and be normal again. So, yeah, I mean, um, the messages, of, the messages of support from everyone have just been completely overwhelming, and I, literally, I just can't thank anyone enough, really. And obviously, the, the you know the, the the two other people in your household that's gone through this, obviously, you know, with yourself and uh, and obviously your dad, um, and obviously with your mum going back. You know, even when your dad was a manager and uh, most women have to put up with a load of shit that, that gets huge. All of us. How has that woman come through, Joe? Uh, obviously, I come and see you yesterday and with her and you know, it's your mum. I don't know if everyone's going to say, you know, and I will do how proud you are of your dad. But your mum is just saying, Kelsey, isn't she? Yeah, mate. Honestly. In the Premier League if she was the manager, wouldn't she? Yeah, she would be, mate. Honestly, yes. And she'd win the European Cup as well. She's just been, she's been unbelievable, mate. Like, what? I don't know the strength. I don't know how strong how, how strong she she's been. It's just it's been incredible the way that she's dealt with everything. You know what I mean? Blow after blow after blow, and to still keep getting back up and getting back up and fighting. But not only not only being there for me, um, being there for my dad. I mean, it's, it couldn't have been nice for her to see her husband falling the way he fell away, Keith. You know what I mean? And uh, everything about him, just obviously, um, and my mum. They've been together since they were at, at junior school, as you know. You know what I mean. So it's a long time, and uh, I think they've been they would have been married for thirty four years this year on their anniversary. So it's it's a long, long time. You know what I mean, mate. But I, I don't know. I, I honestly can't tell you how she's done it, Keith. I, I, I I'd ask her tomorrow. I ask her all the time. Like I said, how are you so strong? You know what I mean. And I think she's just she lost her dad at a young age, and I think that she's just been mentally tough since then. You know what I mean. And uh, 
Yeah, she's um she's been a rock, mate. Honestly, she's been a rock for all of us. Like when when we're when we're having down days, she gets us back up again. And when she's having a down day, we get her back up again. You know what I mean? We're just working together, mate. Really, to just try and get through it, get through this horrible time. And I know it ain't gonna get. Obviously, time's a healer. It ain't gonna get any easier waking up to an empty house without dad every day. But ultimately, all we can do is um is just keep remembering all the good times. Like I said, that's all we that's all we keep doing. Looking back at photos of the tournaments and stuff that we used to do and. Uh, uh, getting drunk with you in the bar, Keith, and things like that. You know what it's like, mate. Yeah, all that sort oh, of man. stuff. Yeah, exactly <laughs> that. So, yeah. And, I mean, and, that, and, that's, and that's the major part, Joe, isn't it? that you've got all their memories because your dad did do a hell of a lot and, and you as a family did, and obviously at the club and, and what you've done. And, and like I said, and, and I can only say, and I can echo what everyone's saying, that um, and I know your dad's watching this. It, he's most probably the proudest person in the world. I know what he thought right. about it. I know what you thought about Lauren as well and, and you were his world. And um, <clears throat> I would say that he is just sitting wherever he is, letting the old players have it still. <laughs> Definitely. Giving, giving Foley a rollicking up there at the moment. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But having a beer, sitting on a stall and <clears throat> and he will be the proudest man and he'll be going, that's my boy. Yeah, nice, no, nice. It's been unbelievable, mate. And uh, like I said, you're, 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 thanks for coming on. It's No, it's my different. pleasure. Pleasure. But it just shows what sort of family you are, I think. And I think, you know, your, your, dad, your dad and your mum's brought you up. Unbelievable, both of us. And Jack, what, we'll, what we'll do, we'll, put, we'll, we'll, we'll cut some of the show away and just have your interview. And we'll, we'll put that out there at some point tomorrow as well, if that's OK with you. We'll put this in yeah, cool. out, uh, solely on its own as well for you as well. Because I, I just echo everything that Keith said, because... Uh, literally took the words out of my mouth about your dad being proud of you. Wow. I've just sat here for the last hour while listening to you, mate, and uh, to be honest with you, mate, I just feel so inspired by you. It's just incredible. So I really do appreciate you coming on tonight and uh, I wish you and your family all the best for the future. I really do. No, I, really, I really appreciate that, boys, and keep obviously doing the show as well. I, I watch it most weeks and it's, uh, it's blinding, so keep doing what you're doing. And any time you want to come on, Joe, you just give us a, you just give Keith a shout and we'll get you on. No problem at all. Cheers, mate. boys. Thanks for everything. Thanks, Joe. Thank Joe, you, mate. Good luck, mate. Take good care, luck. mate. Thanks, Best, mate. Boys. See you, mate. Bye. There you go, mate. Well, I think... What do you say after that? <laughs> I, I, I mean... I, it, wow. I mean, if, if people at home haven't enjoyed that last hour, well, then there's something seriously wrong with people, I think, because that was... Uh, that was incredible. I mean, I was just sitting here at some point, you know, we're looking at the clock and thinking, wow, you know, and then, and then the next minute, you're just so engrossed with everything that Joe was saying, spoke so, you know, incredibly. I mean, it just, you know, and to hear the story of, you know, of how he almost died twice, etc., etc., and it's just, it was just absolutely mind blowing, Keith. I mean, I know you're closer to the family, you know, you're very close to the family as such, but that was just incredible. But I was getting, yeah, I was still getting emotional. David, I said the one thing I've noticed over the the last, well, even when Joe was ill, is just how strong they've been, um, and and the you know the bad, the, the whole story. He could have kept going till ten o'clock, you know. He's, he, you know, they over the few years, like I said, you know, they they lost, they lost Martin, lost his uh, mum, which is obviously you know Joe's grandma. Then, you know, their brother, Martin's brother died. And, you know, only a few days before Martin passed that they had to put their dog down as well. That had been, you know, it's, 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 it's unbelievable. And, and and to get a young lad that, to be fair, that had a tough upbringing, not with the family, because obviously it, it was cast of, of, you know, oh, you're Martin's boy. And, and had to sort of get his way through coaching into football management on his own merit, mm. not because of his dad, his own merit, which was hard, especially around this neck of the woods, because Martin is, is is obviously really well known and and, and how he was and, and, and strong minded. And and to, to be the person he is now, even not with what he went through, well, if I if I've got ten percent of what, what they've got, then then I would be happy. I'm I'm sure. like I said, I'm I'm inspired by him and, mm. and, and whatever and um you know yeah, absolutely. unreal. Absolutely. And like I said, there's so many people that that they they are going to want to thank, and mm. and they will do. And obviously, there's things planned, obviously, in the future for, for to recognise Martin, Joe, and, and the Fools. But wow, if you are an up and coming chairman, the, 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 or a chairman that's looking for someone, 
Joe, Joe Joe's worth a, a, definitely to talk to because if he's got the passion and that that his mum's got, um, and his dad had unbelievably, um, and and with the right guidance, we'll we'll we'll, we'll, we'll carry the legacy on. Absolutely. Well, just a couple of messages before we finish. Danny uh, Danny Martin said, "Lovely interview. Thanks for take uh, for talking about it, Joe. So proud." Uh, Kevin Kevin Watson and what a superstar he is with that story of giving him his thing incredible uh, you know uh, well done for getting him on Keith and then Gary Andrews has said give him the VCD job all day long he could have it if he wanted it I'd let him have it don't worry about that be a better person than me <coughs> perfectly treated one thing Joe forgot to say as well I think Kevin actually took the lead trophy in as well wow so, yeah. so I remember the pictures and, and just it's just what football does. But that, that that will just give you an idea of what they were like. And yeah. like I said, people, you can say Marmite with everybody. You know, Martin was very strong charactered and, 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 and he learned me a hell of a lot. What Joe said about professionalism was right. The way my kits all set out, wait till you tell you, everything, all that people tell, all come from Martin. You know, he took non-league football at the time at the level to a completely different level. Mm. Well, the two hours, as you can imagine, has gone way past. We're way past it. But uh, all I would say is, keep up. I mean, how do we top that next week? Well, I have no idea. But, I mean, if there's anybody out there that's got anybody that wants to come on the show and have a chat with us, exactly the same as Joe's done, uh, I mean, we're more than happy to have anybody to come on the show and have a chat with us as well. And uh, So, please, you know, if there's anybody out there that wants to come on and, and, and tell your story, why not come on and... Uh, uh, and do this, uh, you know, be as brave and as inspirational as, as Joe was tonight. And uh, we'd be more than a pleasure for for you to to, to come on and, and have a chat with me and Keith uh, this time next week. But uh, hopefully, everybody out there has enjoyed the show as much as I have tonight, and I think as Keith has as well. Um, listen, me and Keith will be back next week. Um, but uh, until then, keep yourself safe, keep your family safe, um, and we'll see you again seven o'clock next Monday night. Good night.